Okay, uh, starting up our morning readings again for the next five days. And it occurred to me, uh, somebody had asked a, a question, a broad question recently about um, the six uh, sense bases. And I thought, well, a fundamental uh, teaching of the Buddha around the sense bases, a whole section in the Sanyutta Nikaya uh, that's devoted to uh, the six sense bases, the Salayatana Sanyutta. So I thought I'd do a few readings uh, regarding the six sense bases, and uh, that'll go for maybe a few days, and, and also uh, kind of following the same format of uh, a bit of sutta reading, and uh, then some teachings from Ajahn Chah uh, around that theme, and, and others as well. So there's a lot of different ways that the... Um, Suttas take the approach of contemplation regarding the, the six sense bases, one uh, in a classic format called the, the gratification danger and escape, um, which is a, sort of a formula that I think most everybody is familiar with that is applied to different, different categories of experience, not just the six sense bases, but it's a primary one uh, for six sense base contemplation. And... Uh, also, uh, fetters is a theme that comes up in regard to the six sense bases. Uh, sense restraint uh, is a theme that comes up. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the all-important aspect of developing insight uh, from contemplation of the six sense bases. So it runs a, a, a full scale of, of teachings. And um, I'll just start with a, a few reading, a few short suttas. Uh, the first one uh, being from the Sangyutta uh, Nikaya, the Salayatana Sangyutta, the, uh, the book of the six sense bases. And this first one is uh, Sangyutta number 35, number 13 in that section. And this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. At Sawati. Bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully enlightened, it occurred to me, what is the gratification, what is the danger, what is the escape in the case of the I? What is the gratification, what is the danger, what is the escape in the case of the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind? Then because it occurred to me, the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on the eye, this is the gratification in the eye, that the eye is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, this is the danger in the eye. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for the eye, this is the escape from the eye. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on the ear, the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on the nose, the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on the tongue, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on the body, the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on the mind. This is the gratification in the mind. That the mind and all the others is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, this is the danger in the mind. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for the mind, this is the escape from the mind. So long because as I did not directly know as they really are, the gratification as gratification, the danger as danger, and the escape as escape, in the case of these six internal sense bases, I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, Mara, and Brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, its devas and humans. But when I directly knew all of this as it really is, then I claimed to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. The knowledge and vision arose in me. Unshakable is my liberation of mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. And then the next section goes through the same exact sequence, uh, but instead of the six internal sense bases, the organ itself, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Uh, he goes through the external sense spaces of uh, sights, sounds, uh, smells, tastes, 
uh, tactile sensations and uh, uh, mental activities, the thoughts, essentially the thoughts. So uh, just delineating the fact that there is the internal sense space and the external sense space uh, that come together. And that's an important uh, sequence, the gratification, danger, and escape in, in regards to many uh, different teachings. Uh, essentially, the gratific, not not um, not denying in any way whatsoever that there is a, a certain amount of gratification in sensory experience. That's why we do it. Um, but the the danger uh, uh, is that it's very fleeting uh, and uh, impermanent. Essentially, it's in, impermanent suffering and subject to change. That's the danger, uh, and then. Uh, the removal uh, and uh, the the ending of it uh, being uh, removal of the, the desire and lust that's associated uh, with the contact. That's uh, the Pali is the adinoa asada and nisarana, gratification, danger, and escape. Okay, so another sutta. This one I'm just going to read. Uh, a section from the Majjhima Nikaya the, uh, uh, from the actual Satipatthana Sutta, Majjhima number 10. <clears throat> and in the fourth section, the contemplation of dhammas, uh, contemplation of mind objects, there's uh, several categories of, of reflections within that particular uh, contemplation, within that particular uh, foundation of mindfulness or... Um, establishing of mindfulness, that fourth section. Uh, there's the five hindrances, the five aggregates, the six sense bases, the seven enlightenment factors, and the four noble truths. Uh, and so this is the, uh, the brief section on the six sense base contemplations. Again, bhikkhus. A bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects in terms of the six internal and external sense bases. And how does a bhikkhu abide contemplating mind objects as mind objects in terms of the six internal and external sense spaces? Here, a bhikkhu understands the eye, he understands forms, and he understands the fetter that arises dependent on both. And he also understands how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen fetter, and how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen fetter, and how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned fetter. He understands the ear, he understands sounds, he understands the nose, he understands odors, he understands the tongue, he understands flavors, he understands the body, he understands tangibles, he understands the mind, he understands mind objects, and he understands the fetter that arise dependent on both. And he also understands how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen fetter and how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen fetter, and how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned fetter. In this way, he abides contemplating, in mind, contemplating mind objects as mind objects, internally, externally, and both, internally and externally. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects in terms of the six internal and external sense spaces. So you can see the uh, instructions are to first understand them, uh, to know them, to fully experience them uh, consciously, and then uh, uh, the uh, understanding not only the sense experience, but understanding the fetter that arises dependent on both. M more of that in the next sutta. Uh, and then also to explore uh, as they arise and as they uh, pass away, and as they are released, uh, our attention to those fetters uh, that bind um, us to the sense experience, uh, how their release comes to be as well, uh, as well as how they arise and pass away. So the next uh, reading is from the Chitta Sanyutta. Chitta, of course, meaning... Um, Translation of, or trans, we translate it usually as mind um, or intellect. But this Chitta Sangyutta in Sangyutta Nikaya, connected discourses with Chitta, refers to uh, a person, uh, Chitta, the householder, who I think was the Buddha's foremost lay disciple on expounding the Dhamma. He was very well uh, respected 
teacher in a sense, informal teacher uh, of the Dhamma. And this is from the Chitta Sangyutta um, number one, num 41 number one. On one occasion, a number of elder bhikkhus were dwelling at Machikasanda in the wild mango grove. Now on that occasion, when the elder bhikkhus had returned from their alms round, after their meal, they assembled in the pavilion and were sitting together when this conversation arose. Friends, the fetter and the things that fetter, are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing, or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? Some elder bhikkhus answered thus, friends, the fetter and the things that fetter, that, that fetter are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. But some other elder bhikkhus answered thus, friends, the fetter and the things that fetter are one in meaning and different only in phrasing. Now on that occasion, Chitta, the householder, had arrived in Migapattaka on some business. Then Chitta, the householder, heard a number of elder bhikkhus, it is said, on returning from their alms round, had assembled in the pavilion after their meal and were sitting together when this conversation arose. Then Chitta, the householder, approached those elder bhikkhus, paid homage to them, sat down to one side, and said to them, I have heard, venerable sirs, that when a number of elder bhikkhus were sitting together, this conversation arose. Friends, the fetter and the things that fetter, are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing, or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? That is so, householder. Venerable sirs, the fetter and the things that fetter are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. I will give you a simile for this, since some wise people here understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. Suppose, venerable sirs, a black ox and a white ox were yoked together by a single harness or yoke. Would one be speaking rightly if one were to say, the black ox is the fetter of the white ox, the white ox is the fetter of the black ox? No, householder, the black ox is not the fetter of the white ox, nor is the white ox the fetter of the black ox, but rather the single harness or yoke by which the two are yoked together. That is the fetter there. So too, friend, the eye is not the fetter of forms, nor are forms the fetter of the eye, but rather the desire and lust that arise there in dependence on both. That is the fetter there. The ear is not the fetter of sounds. The nose is not the fetter of odors. The tongue is not the fetter of tastes. The body is not the fetter of tactile objects. The mind is not the fetter of mental phenomena, nor are mental phenomena the fetter of the mind, but rather the desire and lust that arises there in dependence on both. That is the fetter there. It is a gain for you, householder. It is well gained by you, householder, in that you have the eye of wisdom that ranges over the deep word of the Buddha. So uh, important uh, concept in the teaching that you know, w when there's sense experience uh, and uh, desire, lust are arising, um, it's, not, it's not the uh, object that's to blame, nor is it the sense organ that's to blame. You know, so we can't just go around uh, avoiding experience, shutting our eyes, or uh, not being in contact with any kind of pleasurable or unpleasurable uh, sights, sounds, tastes, etc. Uh, but to uh, notice that the actual fetter is the desire and rust, lust that arise when there is that contact between the two bases and to work with it at that level. Yeah, and a, a teaching like that is a really nice illustration that shows as well that uh, the Dhamma is very, uh, the meaning is very uh, precise. It's not just like you, you're you shooting in the dark trying to hit hit a target that you can't see, but it's actually, this is exactly the meaning. This is, this is what these terms mean exactly. And that's yeah. one thing I appreciate about teachings like this. Yeah, very direct. Yeah. Very, they clarify quite well. And one last one uh, of teachings from the Sanyutta Nikaya, also from this section uh, 35, and this is number 88. It's called Puna. Then the Venerable Puna approached the Blessed One and said to him, Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that, having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute. 
Puna, there are forms cognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, delight arises in him. With the arising of delight, Puna, there is the arising of suffering, I say. There are Puna sounds cognizable by the ear, etc., through the six uh, sense bases. Uh, mental phenomena cognizable by the mind that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, delight arises in him. With the arising of delight, puna, there is the arising of suffering, I say. Bhikkhus, there are forms cognizable by the eye, etc., mental, form, mental phenomena cognizable by the mind that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a bhikkhu does not seek delight in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them, delight ceases in him. With the cessation of delight, puna, there is a cessation of suffering, I say. That's the brief uh, exposition on the six sense bases, and there goes, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting uh, second part of this sutta that I'll go ahead and read. Now that you have received the brief exhortation from me, Puna, in which, in which country will you dwell? There is, venerable sir, a country named Sunan Paranta. I will dwell there. Puna, the people of Suna, Suna Paranta are wild and rough. If they abuse and revile you, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Suna Paranta abuse and revile me, then I will think, these people of Suna Paranta are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not give me a blow with the fist. Then I will think thus, blessed, thus, then I will think thus, blessed one. Then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if the people of Suna Paranta do give you a blow with the fist, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Suna Paranta give me a blow with the fist, then I will think, these people of Suna Paranta are excellent, truly excellent and that they do not give me a blow with a clod. Then I will think, blessed one, then I will think thus, blessed one. But Puna, if the people of Suna Paranta do give you a blow with a clod, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if those people give me a blow with a clod, then I will think, these people are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not give me a blow with a rod. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But, Puna, if those people do give you a blow with a rod, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people give me a blow with a rod, then I will think, these people are excellent, truly excellent, that they do not stab me with a knife. Then I will think, thus, blessed one, then I will think, thus, fortunate one. But, Puna, if the people do stab you with a knife, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people stab me with a knife, then I will think, these people are excellent, truly excellent and that they do not take my life with a sharp knife. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if the people do take your life with a sharp knife, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if those people take my life with a sharp knife, then I will think, there have been disciples of the blessed one who, being repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the body and by life, sought for an assailant but I have come upon this assailant even without a search. Then I will think thus, blessed one. Then I will think thus, fortunate one. Good, good, Puna. Endowed with such self-control and peacefulness, you will be able to dwell in the Sunaparanta country. Now, Puna, you may go at your own convenience. Then, having delighted and rejoiced in the blessed one's statement, the venerable Puna rose from his seat, paid homage to the blessed one, and departed, keeping him on his right. He then set his lodging in order, took his bowl and outer robe, and set out to wander towards the Sunaparanta country. Wandering by stages, he eventually arrived in the Sunaparanta country where he dwelt. <clears throat> then during that reigns, <clears throat> the Venerable Puna established 500 male lay followers <clears throat> and 500 female lay followers in the practice. And he himself, during that same reigns, realized the three true knowledges. And during that same reigns, he attained final nibbana. Then a number of bhikkhus approached the Blessed One and said to him, Venerable Sir, the clansman named Puna, who was given a brief exhortation by the Blessed One, has died. 
What is his destination? What is his future born? Bhikkhus, the clansman Puna, was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and did not trouble me on account of the Dhamma. The clansman Puna has attained final Nibbana. So all that is a result of a brief exhortation on the six sense bases. Maybe we will experience that too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to begin a reading from Ajahn Chah, the collected teachings of Ajahn Chah in volume three. Uh, and it's called The Fountain of Wisdom. And I was expecting to read about half of it. I'm not sure if I'll get through half of it because the suttas took a little bit longer than I thought. So we'll see how far we get. The Fountain of Wisdom. All of us have made up our minds to become bhikkhus and samaneras. He's talking to uh, uh, the monastic community here. <clears throat> in the Buddhist dispensation, in order to find peace. <clears throat> now, what is true peace? True peace, the Buddha said, <clears throat> is not very far away. It lies right here within us, but we tend to continually overlook it. People have their ideas about finding peace, but still tend to experience confusion and agitation. They still tend to be unsure and haven't yet found fulfillment in their practice. They haven't yet reached the goal. It's as if we have left our home to travel to many different places. Whether we get into a car or board a boat, no matter where we go, we still haven't reached our home. As long as we still haven't reached home, we don't feel content. We still have some unfinished business to take care of. This is because our journey is not yet finished. We haven't reached our destination. We travel all over the place in search of liberation. All of you bhikkhus and samaneras here want peace, every one of you. Even myself, when I was younger, searched all over for peace. Wherever I went, I couldn't be satisfied. Going into forests or visiting various teachers, listening to Dhamma talks, I could find no satisfaction. Why is this? We look for peace in peaceful places where there won't be sights or sounds or odors or flavors, thinking that living quietly like this is the way to find contentment, that herein lies peace. But actually, if we live very quietly in places where nothing arises, can wisdom arise? Would we be aware of anything? Think about it. If our eyes didn't see sights, what would, be, what would that be like? If the nose didn't experience smells, what would that be like? If the tongue didn't experience flavors, what would that be like? If the body didn't experience feelings at all, what would that be like? To be like that would be like being a blind and deaf man, one whose nose and tongue had fallen off and who was completely numb with paralysis. Would there be anything there? And yet people tend to think that if they went somewhere where nothing happened, they would find peace. Well, I've thought like that myself. I once thought that way, too. When I was a young monk just starting to practice, I'd sit in meditation and sounds would disturb me. I'd think to myself, what can I do to make my mind peaceful? So I took some beeswax and stuffed my ears with it so that I couldn't hear anything. All that remained was a humming sound. I thought that would be peaceful. But no, all that thinking and confusion didn't rise at the ears after all. It arose in the mind. That is the place to search for peace. To put it another way, no matter where you go to stay, you don't want to do anything because it interferes with your practice. You don't want to sweep the grounds or do any work. You just want to be still and find peace that way. The teacher asks you to help out with the chores or any of the daily duties, but you don't put your heart into it because you feel it is only an external concern. I've often brought up the example of one of my disciples who was really eager to, quote, let go and find peace. I taught about letting go, and he accordingly, accordingly understood that to let go of everything would indeed be peaceful. Actually, right from the day he had come to stay here, he didn't want to do anything. Even when the wind blew off half the roof off of his kuti, he wasn't interested. He said that was just an external thing. So he didn't bother fixing it up. When the sunlight and rain streamed in from one side, he'd move over to the other side. That wasn't any business of his. His business was to make his mind peaceful. That other stuff was a distraction. He wouldn't get involved. That was how he saw it. One day I was walking past and saw the collapsed roof. Eh, hey, whose kuti is this? 
someone told me whose it was, and I thought, hmm, strange. So I had a talk with him, explaining many things, such as the duties in regard to our dwellings, the Senasana Vata. We must have a dwelling place, and we must look after it. Letting go isn't like this. It doesn't mean shirking our responsibilities. That's the action of a fool. The rain comes in on one side, so you move over to the other side. Then the sunshine comes out, and you move back to that side. Why is that? Why don't you bother to let go there? I gave him a long discourse on this. Then when I'd finished, he said, Oh, Lung Pa, sometimes you teach me to cling, and sometimes you teach me to let go. I don't know what you want me to do. Even when my roof collapses and I let go to this extent, still you say it's not right. And yet you teach me to let go. I don't know what more you can expect of me. You see, people are like this. They can be as stupid as this. <laughs> are there visual objects within the eye? If there are no external visual objects, would our eyes see anything? Are there sounds within our ears if external sounds don't make contact? If there are no smells outside, would we experience them? Where are the causes? Think about what the Buddha said. All dhammas arise because of causes. If we didn't have ears, would we experience sounds? If we had no eyes, would we be able to see sights? Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. These are the causes. It is said that all dhammas arise because of conditions. When they cease, it's because the causal conditions have ceased. For resulting conditions to arise, the causal conditions must first arise. If we think that peace lies where there are no sensations, would wisdom arise? Would there be causal and resultant conditions? Would we have anything to practice with? If we blame the sounds, then where there are sounds, we can't be peaceful. We think that, play, we think that place is no good. Wherever there are sights, we say that's not peaceful. If that's the case, then to find peace, we'd have to be one whose senses have all died, blind and deaf. I thought about this. Hmm, this is strange. Suffering arises because of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So should we be blind? If we didn't see anything at all, maybe that would be better. One would have no defilements arising if one were blind or deaf. Is this the way it is? But thinking about it, it was all wrong. If that was the case, then blind and deaf people would be enlightened. They would be accomplished if defilements arose at the eyes and ears. These are the causal conditions. Where things arise, at the cause, that's where we must stop them. Where the cause arises, that's where we must contemplate. Actually, the sense bases of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind are all things which can facilitate the arising of wisdom if we know them as they are. If we don't really know them, we must deny them, saying we don't want to see sights, hear sounds, and so on, because they disturb us. If we cut off the causal conditions, what are we going to contemplate? Think about it. Where would there be any cause and effect? This is wrong thinking on our part. I think I'll stop there. Um, and we'll finish this reading tomorrow. Yeah, that, that particular Rajan who, uh, about the half roof, not fixed. He's got a. He's the abbot of a small monastery in Nan province now. Oh, okay. And uh, he made it. Well, uh, kind of. Another. Uh, not many people live with him, but uh, he's. One thing he also did one time was he wanted to contemplate pain, so he decided he would just pick up a huge centipede and get it to bite him, Ooh. so that he could contemplate <laughs> pain. That's the kind of stuff he would do. <laughs> <laughs> he's a unique being. How many pansa is he? He'd probably be like 45 vasas now or something. I was going to say, because when this was written. Ajahn Sinawan. Sin oh, that's Ajahn Sinawan. Okay. That's and then cool. also Long Chao was known to say, if Sinawan's suffering, I'm happy. If he's not suffering, <laughs> I'm not happy. <laughs> well, he must have something going for him if he's, if he's made it this long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's probably learned something. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Uh, John, um, the the duty of understanding suffering. I, I wanted to ask if you could maybe explain a bit more about how to do that 
and and also if maybe that's like a maybe that's a practice that uh, I shouldn't worry about right now at this point. <laughs> but I was just curious. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, no, that's a it's a very good question. It's a and it. I don't want you to worry about it, but it's something that you should engage with <laughs> without worrying about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the first noble truth, as, as, as you're referring to, all the four noble truths have a duty associated with them, in a sense. And the duty of the, of the first noble truth of there is suffering is to fully understand it. And that's important because uh, so often I think... Um, you know, we experience some suffering, and the first thing we want to do is, is go straight to the third noble truth and uh, <laughs> uh, get to experience the cessation. Um, but uh, it usually doesn't work that way because uh, we're, what we're doing is uh, adding a level of aversion um, to the experience of dukkha. You know, this is unpleasant. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want to annihilate it. I want to get rid of it. How can I be free from it right away? So I think the Buddha very skillfully points out, well, actually, we, 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 have to, we have to understand more deeply the actual experience of the first noble truth uh, before we can um, practice it, essentially. Before we have to kind of know what the diagnosis is, you know, know what the problem is, uh, before we can move on to the, uh, the, uh, the treatment plan and the cure. Um, so fully understanding... Um, you know, means just being willing to acknowledge, you know, honestly, uh, uh, to look at the truth of the way things are, uh, to not uh, engage uh, in that uh, attempt to avoid or attempt to skip over, the attempt to pretend it's not there or to annihilate it, uh, but to allow it in uh, as an experience of dukkha. This is dukkha. This is dukkha. And... Uh, in that way, oftentimes in and of itself, that kind of owning up to the truth, essentially, uh, is, is most of the, the path towards release because uh, it involves uh, many of the path factors uh, that we would have to engage in to take, you know, take that, uh, to, to, to feel the release. You know, right mindfulness, acknowledging that it's there and right effort to you know, abandon unwholesome conditions that cause it, pick up wholesome conditions that uh, lead to its uh, alleviation, things like that. Um, but it really starts with uh, not running away from it, fully experiencing it, which doesn't mean indulging in it or uh, attending to um, causes and conditions that cause it to increase or further arise. Um, such as really moving into the experience itself or the memory or the, the habit pattern and uh, really uh, engaging with it in a way that encourages its further development, which is easy to do uh, if we kind of you know, wrap ourselves in, in, in terms of an obsession around thinking about it or... Uh, intellectualizing or hypothesizing or trying to wrangle a, a uh, intellectual way out of the experience of the dukkha. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we're great thinkers. And, uh, and a lot of, you know, sometimes, and I'm not saying this is true in all situations, but sometimes, say, in the Western approach to psychology or psychotherapy can be thinking about it, analyzing it, going to the past, what caused it, uh, uh, those kinds of things, um, kind of in an analytical uh, way of trying to understand it. Um, but sometimes that, that is kind of a substitute, or it can be used, if, if not done skillfully, can be used as a substitute for actual acknowledging and experiencing the, the unpleasantness, the painfulness of it. So rather than proliferating and trying to find a first point, trying to find a cause, you know, in a, se in a sequence of events that may have happened in the past or may be happening in the present, and kind of like trying to intellectually understand it in that kind of a way, we go straight to the experience. Uh, and the best place to do that is in the body, of course. You've probably heard that before <laughs> from many people. Um, uh, we know the experience of dukkha. 
uh, as an embodied experience. The body is very tangible, it registers that. So that's, in my mind, for the most part, the first point of approach to understanding dukkha. Go to the bodily experience, go to that which is unpleasant, and you'll see that's what you're trying to escape. You're trying to escape the unpleasant feeling that's associated with it through all the past ways of doing that before, whether it's rationalizing about it, analyzing it, or you know, engaging in some sort of sensory uh, uh, experience that will distract you from it, you know, going to some pleasant sight, sounds, taste, etc. cetera, you know, going, going to the fridge, <laughs> um, things like that. Uh, that's our usual uh, option number one, uh, is to try and escape it or uh, rationalize it away. Uh, and it doesn't work because you haven't really touched the underlying cause and uh, owned up to the actual experience. And depending on what it is, you know, sometimes that allowance of, of full experience, fully knowing it, um, is enough to allow it to pass on because you're not engaging in aversion anymore to it. You engage in aversion to something like that, then it actually increase. You try and push it away, but that creates your bond to it even more strongly. Um, you know, trying to push it away it increases the the karmic attraction to it, in a sense. So fully acknowledging the actual experience to the extent that you can. It depends on how severe it is, and sometimes it's you know, not possible to get that close to it, but, uh, and you have to take it in little chunks and pieces and skirting around the edges and working your way into it over time. But, um, but that's the basic thing. It's you know, that basic uh, mantra of you know, drop the story, feel the feeling is uh, my approach anyway to, uh, to understanding that first noble truth, the, the duty to understand. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think Lumpur touched on this last night as well, that uh, you know, he understands that, uh, Lumpur didn't say it this way, but uh, something Lumpur said, I can link to it easily. It's like he, understand this is, he understands this is dukkha. So it's like, it's like this, it's yeah. just this is, the dukkha is like this. And uh, so often, yeah, like Ajahn Kuduram said, we're trying to intellectualize it or say, oh, there must be this or that cause or something. But just to come back to the present moment and say, I, I'm suffering right now. It's like this. Or, you know, I'm irritated. I'm upset. This is dukkha. You know, he understands this is dukkha. Sometimes, sometimes when we have these mental states of, say, anger or strong desire, we don't understand that that is dukkha. So understanding this is dukkha rather than I have to get what I want or I need to tell that person what they did wrong. That's not, under, that's not understanding this is dukkha. But if you understand when those states arise, oh, right, this is dukkha, then it's quite, quite good. Quite powerful, yeah. Those three words either, the three words of this is dukkha or the or the three words of it's like this <laughs> both kind of point to the to the same thing and yeah ajahn sumedho is really uh, he, he just hammers that over and over <laughs> again in the you know the first noble truth sometimes in the old days anyway sometimes you'd see people who don't know you know the teachings very well translated as everything is suffering everything is dukkha which is not the case but ajahn sumedho uh, just as Ajahn Anik was saying, turns it into a present moment experience of here is dukkha, you know, this is dukkha, as a, as a contemplative experience right here, right now. It's like this. Not to dismiss it, but just kind of say, no, it's just like this, but say, oh, no, this is, this is what it's like. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay, it's just about nine, so we'll uh, call it a, a day for this morning.